And today I'd like to talk about Neo4j Spatial, which I was uh, part of the development team back in 2010 and 11 uh, as a collaborative effort between my employers then and Neo Technology. So this talk is going to cover a few things. I'd like to introduce Neo4j, give you some background as to what it is, how it works, as well as talk about the spatial that we did back then and some of the new spatial. I have the impression that there's quite a range of different people here, people who don't know Neo and uh, maybe need to see some introductory material and then of course people who are experts on it. So what I think I'll do is I'll just go through everything at a reasonably quick pace, but stop me at any point if there's something you want to uh, know a little bit more about, something you have questions about. I love starting this with my daughter, because she's so cute. But this is a challenge that I uh, challenged Peter Neubauer about five years ago. Challenged him to see if he could find my secret mushroom picking spot. And no one has succeeded yet, but it is possible. I'm worried with you in the audience there, Stephen. <laughs> and you might have told me already. Yeah? Really? Yeah, you pointed to a few places on the map in the office. Yeah, that's not good enough. <laughs> but the thing is, you've all heard of OpenStreetMap, right? Uh, this is something that's very well known. So OpenStreetMap, open data, everyone contributes to it, so have I. And one of my various contributions has been the roads where I go mushroom picking. And so if you could write a GIS processing script that could analyze where in the world I have made OpenStreetMap contributions and look for islands and things like that and rule out my workplace and my home, you might be able to find it. But before we get into the spatial side of things, the mapping side, I will, would like to just introduce you to graph databases and Neo4j in particular. This is a slide by, uh, from a presentation by Emil Ephraim a couple of years ago at Graph Connect. He was pointing out how some really big names are starting to use the word graph and graph databases, mostly around social networks, interconnected data, big data relationships. Oh. Apparently I've got a meeting now. There we go. And the particular term that was coined here is social graph. And there is a Marissa Mayer from HP, and she's quoting Zuckerberg from uh, Facebook. So all of these big names are talking about graphs more and more and more and more. And we're also seeing books being published about it. So the last five years have seen a dramatic increase in interest in this. And the reasons for it are driven largely by the internet the prevalence of large volumes of highly connected data that traditional solutions are not coping with any, very well anymore. Relational databases don't scale well enough for highly connected complex models. And the NoSQL databases, while they scale incredibly well, don't deal with connections and com uh, complicated models. They deal with only with scaling simple data. So I'm going to just flip through a few areas where this is clearly relevant. Social networks, obviously Facebook, your friends, your friends, friends, what your friends watch, what movies they're interested in, things like that. Network impact analysis, tracing problems in networks, any network, of course, very, very relevant to connect to data. Logistics and routing, where do your parcels go? What's the most efficient way of shipping products from one place to another? Classic map problem here, route finding, where do... I drive, if I want to go from here to there, what's the best way to go? Recommendations, especially connected to social networks. I want to look at my friends, see what movies they've watched, or even better, find people that I don't know who've watched the same movies as me and see what else they've watched that I haven't watched and maybe I should go see that. Probably interesting. That's very, very much a graph problem. Access control. Fraud analysis, there's, there's tons of it. So almost anywhere where you get connectivity, relationships, Neo4j is relevant. So I ran you through that without telling you what a graph is. That's because that stuff should be familiar to you. You should understand the principles of connectivity and relationships. But a graph, if we go back to the origins, was defined as something like this with vertices, points, objects, 
that are connected by edges. Those are original definitions. Neo4j uses slightly different terms for these, node and relationship, but it's basically the same thing. I don't know what Orient does. Uh, same. same as Neo. Okay. Titan uses vertex and edge. And Neo4j follows a particular type of graph called a property graph data model that has four main components, which I will go through step by step. The first one are these nodes. So these are the objects you'd put data on, perhaps, elements of your model. Second one would be relationships. Relationships are something you must really keep in mind. I've said the word many times, and uh, this is something that's really important because many systems support relationships in some way, like a relational database, but they do it inefficiently, whereas this one does it very efficiently. And I have a slide much later on that shows you why, if we get there. More about relationships here. You can have uh, different types of relationships. You can have multiple relationships between the same nodes, representing different aspects of the relationship. You can even have a relationship to yourself. Labels, something that was added in Neo4j2, makes it a bit easier for us to model our domain if we can label the nodes. It makes it easier to match to an object structure where you have classes and easier to find things. So those are the four things. Nodes, relationships, properties. Properties was important there. And that is attaching information to nodes and relationships. And then, of course, the labels. So that's the theory of Neo4j. There's more to talk about Neo4j, but before we go there, I want to introduce you to the spatial library that we developed back in 2010. Sorry. This slide is pretty boring. Um, it's there for reference if you look at the slides later on. I don't think we need to go through this, but it's the fundamentals of this library. And the important aspect of what we did in this library is we tried to produce a fully featured GIS, Geographic Information System, supporting points, polygons, line strings, and any kind of geometric operation between these. So to turn Neo4j into a true geographic database. But this was built as an external library to the product. So it is actually a library of utilities to help you model geographic data in the graph. It's not a part of Neo4j. It doesn't make Neo4j into a GIS database. And that's a key point because we're starting to look at fixing that. Something that we did that year is we uh, produced adapters so we could actually plug Neo4j and this library as a database backend to GIS systems. This particular one is a GIS based on the Eclipse RCP project. So it's an Eclipse application. And um, we can expose OpenStreetMap, which by the way is a fully connected single graph. OpenStreetMap is one graph across the whole world. Most GIS data doesn't look like that, but it should. OpenStreetMap have got it right. So we had to take this fully connected graph, split it up, into all the various layers that can be drawn differently to achieve the picture we want. Because normal GISs have the data all split up, but deep down, it's still connected. And that's an important point there. Yeah, that previous slide, by the way, was my hometown, and this is the close-up of it. Almost every street and thing here was cycled by me with a little GPS and uh, contributed to OpenStreetMap. It's really Great fun. If you're inter interested in mapping in the slightest way, contribute to OpenStreetMap. It's a really good learning curve. I did this as a side project just to get myself familiar with the data model, and that was really, really useful. Anyway, this is visualized also inside a GIS backed by Neo4j. I don't want to go into too much detail here. If you're really interested in OpenStreetMap, I could spend some time explaining to you how OpenStreetMap is structured. But uh, this is maybe beyond the scope of this context. I'll point out only one interesting thing on the slide. This is a point in space, x, y, latitude, longitude. It's connected to two paths. 
This is something that most GISs don't do. If you have an intersection with streets, you will have one road and you'll have another road, and they are separate. You have to do some mathematical calculations to work out that they actually have a common point. Whereas in this data model, that common point is encoded in the graph. You don't have to calculate if it's common. It's built in. It's fixed. And this is the characteristic of OpenStreetMap, and obviously Neo4j or any graph database will support that principle natively. So that also results in a very high performance if you ask the question, do these streets intersect? Doesn't have to be calculated. Another view of it, this is interesting. What we did, very non-standard, is we built a tree structure in the graph that was our spatial index. Most people have a spatial index as an external index that is not part of their data model. In this solution, we actually make the index part of the data model. Indexes are always trees, and a tree is a graph. So you have the OpenStreetMap data model, and we have the index, and we can actually navigate between these two. And this allows you to do things that are not possible with traditional indexes. For example, if you have an index of the world, and I ask, tell me what is near me in this world, what you have to do with a traditional index is build a little box around yourself, throw it at the top of the index, and it searches its way down until it finds all of the things that are in that box. With this one here, if you're there, you can just go up and down, instant. And the performance of that query doesn't change based on the size of the data. So if I index this room, take two milliseconds to get the answer. If I index the planet, two milliseconds. There's no other system that could do that. All right, more detail on this. OpenStreetMap model. Again, I think anyone interested in OpenStreetMap come to me afterwards. This is a very interesting model. Our spatial index and a bunch of views that we created to allow you to query the index with predicates, with like a where condition. Find all streets that have a name starting with A that would be defined in this and as the traversal. So we had some quite powerful things. The um, query language we used for that was CQL. It's a generalization of SQL that uh, is supported by many GIS systems. So the GIS people would find that quite useful. Routing, obviously. <laughs> it's a graph database. Routing was definitely thrown in there. Moving on to 2011, there's one important thing that was added here. It was the geoprocessing pipeline allowing you to plug a stream of operators that operate on your data, that transform them, and you can do then any number of complex things with your GIS data. So if you're a GIS person, this should uh, be right up your alley, but I, I'm not going to go into detail on that. I'll show you just one more thing on this old API. It's a Java library for embedded Neo4j use. Already we see a limitation over here. Simple use case though, create a coordinate, layer find closest points to that position within 10 kilometers. Classic example. That's the simple case. But it's Java. That doesn't suit everybody. Uh, here's my, I did a blog about this in 2011. I generated data with the words Neo4j spatial and then when you find, you find the spa. So I thought I'd show just a couple of apps that were built based on Neo4j some cool things before we move on to the new stuff. This is an app made in Eastern Europe. Uh, it was an iPhone app for routing in a, I can't remember the city, but there was a city there. Maybe anyone who recognized the language there. I was um, simply providing support to the guy who built this. So that was an app that went live and was in use. And it's, ah, oh, I should have read that. Eh? Got better eyes than me. <laughs> yeah, so routing is a classic, classic case for a graph database. It's definitely very much more efficient than other databases, which normally have to pull the data out of their, say it's a relational database, they pull the data out into an in-memory structure, which is a graph. They root on that graph and they present the results. Whereas here you can root on the database directly. Ah. Some little bit of fun that I had. I um, 
wanted to analyze OpenStreetMap. I played around with it and I just made a little demo of contributions to Cyprus over a one week period. Each color is a different OpenStreetMap user. And this is as they drive or cycle or take buses, whatever, and contribute to OpenStreetMap. So this is a animation of people mapping Cyprus back in 2011. So it's, there's a lot more that you can do with OpenStreetMap, of course, but this is why I wanted something live. So you can actually see the action happening. So over, a, I think, a three-month period, it grew. there was a peak in OpenStreetMap contributions. It really grew very, very dramatically during that time. Ah, that's one I liked. It was really cool. I got contacted by a developer working for one of the big theme park companies in the US. Not, not SeaWorld or Busch Gardens or anything, but um, I used this example just to show it. And he wanted to know how he could root on a drawing on an artistic map. So you can't do routing normally on an artistic map. There's no information for that. Routing is something you do on a real map. So I gave him some advice on how he should, could be able to do this. And that is to take the artistic map, find the open street map, or your own, that matches that area. And you can see that they are sort of similar, but they're not exactly the same. We need to figure out where these points are in common. So you find all of the points of interest that are in common and, of course, you need to find points along the actual paths and connect them. So in other words, you've got a mapping of the positions here, the XY positions, to the open street map points that exist in the real GIS data. Then you can route on this, but use that as your GUI. And of course, you end up with your routing app. So the guy is walking around. He's got his map as provided by the theme park vendor. And he wants to know where's the nearest coffee shop. Afterwards, where's the nearest toilet? And uh, this will tell him how to get there on the artist drawing, because that's what they want the users to see. That's what they want the customer to see, an artist drawing not the real map. And then that works. Really nice. So that was also with Neo4j. Uh, this one's my own, actually. My previous um, company worked with uh, cellular telecoms. We helped uh, network operators optimize their networks, but we needed to get data from the network hierarchy, where they had their towers, how their antenna were configured, and we needed to measure where the phones went. So we had apps running on phones, smartphones of all types, and the apps would just measure signal strength, measure upload download speeds, measure a lot of stuff as they went, and also GPS. So the purple here are GPS and all the others are others. I think in this case, this is signal strength, green stronger than others. We had to model that. And the best model was, of course, a graph. Tree structure of the network hierarchy, a tree is a graph. Here is your, uh, the model of the antennas in the graph, your site plus your antennas. It's just a little tree structure. And what really nice, again, this is another great thing about Neo4j, the database model looks like how you see it in your head. When I go to cellular engineers and I present this, they feel very comfortable. Data structures for the uh, drive as well. Over time, next, 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 chains, hierarchical relationships all combined, helping us to analyze this data very, very efficiently. I mentioned earlier on that I could show you an example of why Neo4j performs really, really well. And this network one is uh, a classic for me. Because if you compare it to a relational database and you want to ask the question, given this site, give me my antennas. That's all I want to know for that site. In a relational database, you have two tables, your site table, 
and your sector table or antenna table. And this has to have a foreign key back into the site table. So the question, give me all of the and sectors for site one, requires scanning this whole table and finding these things. The performance of that will be order n for an unindexed table, order log n for an index table. And I think anyone familiar with relational databases is aware of this. So the problem is, this is fine when it's small, but if you've got 100, you've got 10 million in here. We had customers in China. They had 10 million or more. It doesn't work. That question becomes very, very, very slow. In Neo4j, the question going from there to there takes the same speed regardless of this, how much data you've got. It's a direct connection. What a one. Fantastic. Everyone understood that, right? Because it's a key point. <laughs> uh, indexes. So what's next? The uh, last part of this talk, I wanted to just present where we're going with neo 4 Spatial, what we want to do now. And this carries on from what I said before about the old library being a Java library really targeted at embedded database users. What we did with that old library is we wrapped it in a REST API and we even made it possible to access it a little bit through Cypher and try to make it possible for people to use with the, with the remote database, which is where Neo4j is today. It's much more commonly used as a remote database. But the original library wasn't really designed for that. It's a utility library for people to model their data. It's not a GIS index system for large scalable systems. So we're going to build it we are building it from scratch, targeting this new world, remote access, cipher querying, remote querying, uh, highly scalable, high performance. So we're going about it in a completely different direction. And instead of Java, we're going to use cipher as the primary use case. This is how you access Neo4j Spatial. Now I've used the word cipher, I think, four times in one minute, and I, don't, I haven't told anyone what it is. Some of you know very well, and some of you may not have any idea, so I think I will, uh, well, I'm going to define Cypher, but before I do that, I had one other little demo to show you. We did a prototype last year of Spatial Cypher. So it's a very simple one. It doesn't do anything too fancy, but uh, finding restaurants in a region, you just draw this area, so this is where I want to go. And then you can also search by different categories. This kind of capability has been there since the beginning. But the key difference with this demo is what the user interface is doing here is sending Cypher queries. Single queries in the Cypher query language that include the question, give me, say, restaurants in this polygon in that complex region. And that worked pretty well. Um, we didn't like the Cypher syntax we used. There were a few issues that we didn't really like. So we, we didn't take this to product. We've since then redesigned how we want to do it. And I'm going to give you a sneak peek at uh, what we're going to do next here. Because I think it looks really nice. And if you program Cypher, I think you'll find this very, very comfortable. So let me define Cypher. Let's start with an area that you probably are familiar with, and that's SQL. If you ask a question as simple as this, I want the skills uh, of the user, Michael. And you might have a, a user table, a skills table, and a join table. And this requires two joins, a join to the join table, another join to the skills table. It's getting a little convoluted, and you have some performance issues with all these joins. And the reason we have a join table instead of just direct foreign keys is also you may have attributes on this. The date that user acquired that skill, perhaps, is something you might want to maintain. So this model can't be simplified. What about Cypher? The graph model is a little bit different. Colors are the same. We've got attributes on the users, we've got attributes on the skills, and we can have attributes on the relationships, which is replacing the join table. 
And the question, look at that, really, really simple. Match that user who has the skill, a skill, give us the skills. Go back one, just compare the SQL. Uh, we've had to even throw out a lot of stuff here, right, just to keep it simple. You have to admit that's easier to read. It's really, really straightforward. Let's make more joins. How about person, friend, if they're direct friends, and then the friends of those friends. If the friendship has attributes on it, then in, in a relational database, you would have had four joins, right? One, two, three, four. It gets really, really bad. SQL does not perform well in that situation, whereas this is super, super fast in a graph database. So I don't want to talk more about Cypher. I, I wanted a very brief intro to Cypher before I show you what it is we're working with right now. And this is the new Cypher syntax for NeoVJ Spatial. This first part is optional. We now will treat the spatial index just like any other index. It's only there to change the performance. If you don't have that, everything else works. If you have that, it works faster. So what is this doing? We want to ask the question, find cities where the distance between a certain point and the city center is less than some distance. That's the same question that I showed you in the Java API before. This is a bit simpler and easier to read, but it's the same basic use case. And I just defined the, this point up here. It could have, we could have put this literal directly in there as well, doesn't matter. Something you might find slightly messy is the fact that we've had to include latitude and longitude here. This is done for a very good reason. GIS, traditionally when you talk about geographic positions, you say latitude followed by longitude, but latitude is Y and longitude is X, if you draw it on a chart. And everyone gets them mixed up and puts them the wrong way around, including us, at least once. So it's uh, this way, you can't get it wrong. One of the design goals of Cypher is to make it as easy as possible for the user to get what they want done without making mistakes. So this is a, a clear thing. Any questions on this? Let's look at the index. Oh. In the first release, yeah. In the first release, a point is going to be confined to 2D WGS84. And then the plan is to generalize to more coordinate systems and more, uh, yeah, projections. The whole lot, of course. But we want to get something out that's super reliable and fast. So we're sticking to 2D WGS84 just in the first release. Have you got a use case for 3D? Okay, that's very good. I know people who do, so it's very interesting. There was a guy asking questions about uh, building databases, so three-dimensional databases, and they want to store that in the FJ. So we do have a demand for that. Another difference here, um, you may not have realized it if you read between the lines in the earlier slides, the old index is an R tree, and R tree is a good index for all kinds of geometries polygons and line strings, it can support something very small and very, very large in the same index. That generalization comes at a cost. It's a little bit expensive to insert into it and it doesn't query as fast as an index that might be dedicated to something simpler. So what we're doing here, another reason for doing um, points only in the first release is this index is going to be optimized for point data, 2D point data, and as a result will be much faster than the old one. Another difference is the old one was an index in the graph, and that's really convenient and nice to see, but it cannot perform as well as a dedicated index, because the structures on a dedicated index will be simplified for that use case only, take up a lot less memory, can be loaded off disk much faster, so we'll actually have higher performance for that as well. The old library uh, was anecdotally compared to PostGIS at about four times slower than PostGIS on the same basic index query. So if you just want to do pure, pure index queries, you wouldn't use us. If you want to do graph stuff and indexing, yeah, then, then we make sense. But when we go with this, we should be better at everything. Next one.
we want to search within a polygon. That was that demo that I gave you. First of all, we have to define a polygon. This is a uh, rectangle square type shape, but I've done a polygon minus another polygon. I've made a hole in the polygon. So this is like a square donut, a Minecraft donut, sort of. <laughs> That's important. So we can actually support um, multi-polygons with a plus operator there. So polygon plus polygon plus polygon. Then you can get the border of Russia, which has got a little piece of Russia next to Poland there as well. And you can cut out pieces, seas and lakes and things. Or you could define a lake with an island in it. Or what about a lake with an island that has another lake in it? You, know, you can do some complicated stuff. If you've worked with the uh, GIS libraries and you look at the way they do it, they have this really horrible syntax where you have to pass arrays of arrays of arrays of numbers. And very easy to get your numbers mixed up with the arrays in the wrong order and there's no check. We decided to support only array of point. That's it. There's nothing else. Array of points for your polygon. And if you want complex stuff, minus, plus, you build polygons together. And that's a lot uh, more type safe. Much less likely that you'll make a mistake. So here's an example of using it. Make a polygon, or you could have loaded this from somewhere. Call it shape. I'm going to find all restaurants where the location of the restaurant is within that shape. So this is the query that that demo would use. And it works, I mean, the demo, uh, which is code that we've thrown away, actually worked really, really fast. So this better version is going to be even faster. The next thing to look at is, uh, what about indexing polygons? This gets back to your question, more than points or more than 2D. We need a different index. We haven't decided on the syntax yet, but this is an index that can handle more than points and will be optimized differently. And then we can... Do the search the other way around. Let's say create a point, find cities where the shape of the city contains the point. So that'll be your polygon. And that's been stored in the index. Very simple example. But this is an important step to take next. This is not in the first release. And the syntax of this is not in stone yet either. Right. That's it for me.